Okay, it's my absolute pleasure to thank Professor Jeff Wallace for agreeing to this interview as a contribution to the What Raymond Williams Means to Me section of our centenary web pages. And Jeff, I know you've been engaging with Williams's work for, for many years. Um, as a long-standing member of the Raymond Williams Society, one of the founding um, people uh, associated with the Keywords Journal. Um, I'm also aware of the 1995 conference you organised at the University of Glamorgan, as it was then, and, um, and the subsequent edited book that came out of that, Raymond Williams Now, which was published in 1997, all of which seems like an awfully long time ago. Um, and I just wonder if I can begin by asking how you actually discovered Raymond Williams back in the day, how you how you became very interested in his work back then. Sure. Thanks. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Jan, as well, to uh, to think again about Williams. Um, you know, it, it is uh, my main years of involvement with Williams are quite a way back uh, now. Uh, as you said, about 20, 25 years, really. So, um, so it's been really interesting, you know, to uh, to look back at um, at some of the work from then. Um, so, yeah, as, as you as you said, I mean, my um, the, the involvement in the Raymond Williams Society. Again, that's a bit. It's kind of shrouded in the mist of time a little bit. But I, I think I, I joined the society uh, somewhere around about the the mid, uh, mid 90s or early or mid 90s. Um, um, but obviously I, I'd known about William's work for quite a while before then. And uh, thinking about the, you know, how I encountered it, how I found Williams. Um, I, I think that the, um, the first really important context for that actually was, um, was my first, um, first teaching post, first full-time teaching post, which was in the mid eighties, um, which was at, which was at um, Liverpool Polytechnic, as it then was, Liverpool John Moores University now. And, um, and actually this, you know, thinking about um, Williams, for me is, is, it is, this is very much a, a story about new universities, because I've spent um, virtually all of my career uh, teaching in what we now call the new universities, you know, the post-92 or the, um, uh, the ex-polytechnics, obviously. And, and in fact, my first degree was a polytechnic degree as well. So, and, and I think what's interesting about that, what I realise now is that a lot of the, um, uh, the, the very, very innovative kind of course design, course designs and deliveries of, of you know, humanities that were going on then, um, uh, just have amazing affinities with Williams's work. You know, Williams was kind of was was made in a way for these um, new universities or the polytechnics who were were kind of starting their humanities and their literature degrees from scratch. You know, inventing them from scratch. And Williams, I think, because of his um, his concern to kind of break down disciplinary barriers and uh, and so on. Um, uh, and to kind of shake up, you know, the, well, first of all, to kind of found something that you might call cultural studies, you know, which went across lots of disciplines. Um, these things were, were enormously important for the new university sector. Or, so although he himself, um, I don't think he had a lot of contact with that sector, but actually I think his work was was kind of perfectly matched for it, uh, for its development, you know. But to come back to, to Liverpool there, I was working on a, with colleagues on a, a really interesting interdisciplinary degree there, which was about, essentially it was about teaching literature and history together, um, you know, but in a genuine way, you know, genuinely together in a way that they weren't polarized in any sense. And that actually involved, you know, um, which seems quite radical now, teaching sessions, you know, where you'd have uh, a teacher of literature and a historian in the same in the same room with students and so on. You know, it was actually it was a degree that was, that was called literature, life and thought, which I think is a kind of maybe slightly ironic um, kind of reprise of the uh, Cambridge Tripos exams, you know, at that time, which were kind of fueled by Levis's ideas, really. But um, Williams then, that's when I really became aware of the value of Williams's work, because they were fantastic, if nothing else, 
um, fantastic uh, teaching tools, uh, especially those books, you know, where he really did focus on literary form, because, of course, he was doing so much else, you know, and from the mid 70s onwards, you know, he was working in kind of, you know, high theory in some sense, if you think about Marxism and literature, but books like The Country and the City, um, uh, the book on the English novel, uh, Keywords itself as well, um, you know, these texts, we, I think we found then, were brilliant examples to kind of share with, with students at that time. Examples of how, you know, ways of doing literary study, say studying literature with history in a way that doesn't make history simply a kind of passive background. You know, we were always saying that to students, you know, history is not just context, it's not just background. Um, but how those things actually interacted, you know, was, was a kind of key question. But Williams was, those, those books, I think, were a fantastic um, example, you know, of how to, of, of that, that kind of interest, you know, in practice, really. So I think that's what, you know, intellectually, that's where I first um, became aware of his importance. And then I was still doing, I was finishing off my PhD then as well on, on D.H. Lawrence. And then I guess then I became more aware of his work, especially his essays on Lawrence. And, and that, that led me into realising uh, I suppose where Williams was was coming from, and I'm thinking here really in terms of of class of the the role of class in his work. And I, I began especially when I read Culture and Society in the Long Revolution seriously. I realised that that obviously, and I think many people have had this experience that that Williams was speaking for me in lots of ways in terms of our trajectory into the educational world, you know, in other words, from, you know, a working class environment where, you know, educational resources and opportunities are, are, are pretty slim, you know, um, uh, to, um, uh, to find yourself in that world then. And, and to kind of think, so, you know, so what, what, what is the model of intellectual work you know that I have to. What am I? Why? How am I doing this intellectual work? And what kind of work, you know, um, should I be doing? Um, becoming aware of all those, you know, the things that that Williams called, and even right right towards the end of his writing life, back in it, up back, you know, into the say about 1983, he was still writing about um, what he called the unevenness, unevennesses of literacy and education. And, um, you know, coming into a, a, a field where nothing could be taken for granted in the way that, that others perhaps could take certain things for granted. You know, you have to work out your path, don't you? And, um, and I think that Williams, you, you, when you read uh, Williams as uh, more kind, you know, his, his theories of culture, and you suddenly become aware that he's addressing that, you know, he, being able to point out that that whole that whole historical transition, that possibility was there in Lawrence and not just Lawrence, but in George Eliot and Thomas Hardy as well. You know, they're all writing about that encounter, which, you know, the, the border country that, that Williams went on to write about in his own novels. So I became very aware that this was, a, you know, someone who was important to, to me and that helped me to, um, you know, to link his work to others. And, you know, that... <laughs> I suppose you could say he pioneered a way and, and it's the kind of thing these days, isn't it, now that we, we see writers like Lindsay Hanley doing and, and uh, DJ Erebon in France and, uh, and then before that people like Mark Fisher, I think, Carolyn Steedman and then, you know, going right back to Williams himself and Richard Hoggart, you know, so that their work always has this sense of, um, you know, giving some sense of the of the, the the class context for for intellectual work you know so that that was i suppose that was what led me eventually to um to join the society and then and also by that time you know thinking about you mentioned the conference at glamorgan in 95 and i guess that pointed to um uh a kind of geographical there was a just a or geopolitical logic for that, if you like. I found myself working at the Polytechnic of Wales, as it was then, 
from 89. I'm, you know, I moved to South Wales in the late 80s. And it just seemed to make sense, given that, again, you know, Williams's work had become so important for me, that, that we should be helping that work, you know, helping to develop that work there, you know, because we were the closest to Williams's, you know, country, really. We're the closest university to that. So I guess that was how that really was generated, you know. Um, I mean, I think I seem to remember that finding out that Williams had once given a lecture um, at the Polytechnic of Wales in the uh, in the early 80s, something yeah. like that. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, th I think that's how it started, really. I mean, there was already a very, at the Poly then, there was a very strong Department of Culture and Communications, which, again, was very indebted, I think, to Williams's work, you know, in, in those areas of communication and in particular. Um, so um, it seemed the right place to, to do that, you know, so that's how, and I think, you know, my involvement in the society um, was around about the same time. And then the production of the, the book, um, Knowledge Limits and the Future was happening at the same time as the first number of, um, of keywords as well really mm -hmm. so that's the you know that i think that's the the background really to to me finding williams yeah, was there ever a period of time where maybe you you lost williams and left him behind a little bit and maybe moved on to other things um i i think that was always there from from the outset really i mean i i i, I certainly um remember thinking that i mean that the, the whole the whole orientation of the of the conference was about Williams's ideas about the future to some extent. You know where where are we going, um, and um, and there was always a sense of, of of a kind of critical vigilance about that of thinking. Well, you know, is is Williams? Um, what is there in Williams that that can help us to to move forward? You know, in in terms of a you know radical transformation. Of society in terms of you know the struggle with capitalist culture um, uh, and the struggles you know within our disciplines and so on um, there was always a sense for me at least of, of, of constantly kind of um, scrutinizing Williams's work um, and I think that was is perhaps symbolized in the fact that um, one of our keynote uh, speakers, um, keynote contributions at the conference was Stephen Connor. Um, uh, and his essay, Raymond Williams's Time, actually found its way uh, both into the book and into the first number of, um, of keywords. And of course, that essay is asking, uh, begins by asking, you know, is it time for Raymond Williams, you know, and, and, and concludes um, in a sense, by by saying that that Williams's time is not quite our time, uh, uh, he's interested in a certain kind of anachronism in Williams's idea of the, of the kind of temporality, the kind of temporal order that a, that a socialist transformation implied for him, that it implied a kind of wholeness, uh, which was which was out of sync in a way, kind of out of step. Um, with uh, the complexities with with where we were going, you know, and um, as you you probably know from the um, from our introduction to that volume, um, I mean it's not it's not adulatory <laughs> in any way, uh, you know. And, and my interest then was to I was I, I guess I was kind of worrying away a little bit at the, at, at questions of of again about the kind of situatedness of intellectual work. You know, here we all are, were working at um, a new university, which even in the mid nineties, so before new labor and certainly before the introduction of student fees and, and, and before the marketization of things really accelerated, even in the mid nineties, we were reading again that introduction, really concerned about certain things that were going, you know, aspects of the casualization um, and the vocationalization of our subjects and so on. You know, the, the, we were saying that, you know, there were a number of pressures which we, we kind of put into tension with um, Williams's own model 
of of intellectual work, you know, which um, I, I think seemed to me at the time to be slightly anachronistic and to raise uh, lots of questions. I now realize, by the way, incidentally, that what we missed out of that picture, um, of Williams at least in his work at that time, was the 1950s and all of those years, 15 years of working for in adult education. Yeah. Which from, you know, from from I think it was 1949, was it? To mm. uh, no, from 1946, I think, to, to 1961, before he was appointed to the fellowship at Cambridge. And he worked then in adult education for the Oxford delegacy um, and for the UEA, I think, um, for 15 years. So, you know, Williams himself certainly had 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 a, a, a different uh, had to follow a different model of intellectual work there and uh, you know a much more problematic one he was I think it was Terry Eagleton who said that um, uh, you know Williams was always extramural <laughs> in a sense himself you know maybe first when he went to Cambridge to study and then you know eventually when he went to Cambridge after those 15 years in in um, adult education. But having said that, I suppose getting back to the introduction, you know, I was kind of questioned that 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 image uh, that he gave us from towards 2000 of um, of, of the, the, the present culture of distraction, as he called it, and he, he conjured up this image of someone sitting in a room, trying to think, desperately trying to think at a desk. Um, <laughs> while, as he put it, there was a fan dance in one corner and a military band playing in the other. And I just felt that that was such a curious image to come out even in 1983. The fan dance and the military band um, seemed to say a lot to me, really, about possibly about the, the sense in which, you know, Williams was... Uh, kind of inhabiting a, a, a different kind of temporal order and his work was coming from that. Um, so there, there was always a sense and, and, and certainly when Keywords the Journal um, was established, I mean, there were, I remember many lively and, uh, and, and animated, you know, conversations about the orientation of the journal, not just what it should be called, but um, you know, what it was about. And I think we were clear, you know, myself and fellow editors, you know, at the time in, in, in getting the whole thing going, that this was a, a journal of cultural material, it was exploring cultural materialism and its possibilities and limits, etc. you know, rather than it wasn't the, although it was closely affiliated to the Raymond Williams Society and, and you know, the society enabled us to, to get the journal going, but it, it wasn't the journal of the society, uh, nor was it a journal of Raymond Williams studies as such, you know, it was about where can you take this work and, and therefore also about, um, you know, critically interrogating it as well, you know, submitting it always to, um, to thought about renewal and so on. So, um, so there was always that. And, and then I guess I did, you know, for pragmatic reasons, um, you know, the, the, the editorship of the journal was passed on to a new team um, who were largely based more in the East Midlands in Nottingham. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I, you know, my research was taking me elsewhere then, but, but I, I suppose there is a sense um, that there was an interesting kind of transition in, I suppose, my thinking. And this sounds terribly Oedipal. It sounds as if I'm transferring loyalties from one kind of masculine male figure to another. But I became very interested in the work of John Berger uh, fr from the 2000s. And actually that, that led to a, a conference in 2014 on Berger in Cardiff. Um, and and I, I, I think that transition for me from one to the other, um, uh, was, was was quite symbolic, really, um, in in the sense, obviously, their their formations, their orientations were very very different. You know, Berger is much more of a creative figure. You know, he he emerged really as a you know as a visual artist, a draftsman, and a, um, a painter, and so on. Uh, um, before he 
became a, an art critic and a cultural critic and you know Berger never went anywhere near a university um, although they did you know both Williams and Berger worked for the WA in the 1950s which is an interesting oh. mm. yeah I didn't they, know that I didn't know about Berger and the WA yeah oh. yeah um, but I, I found I suppose what I'm cutting a long story short here what I'd want to say is that I found more and more in Williams um, a kind of um, a problem with affect somehow a kind of unwillingness um, to um, you know given his the tenacity and the the passion really of um, his concern for a socialist future I found that his writing um, didn't really register that or couldn't register that in a way that Berger is much more open and, and, and um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Berger writes with a, a sense of affect, I think, a sense of feeling, if you like, or, or uh, the ability to, to express feeling that Williams couldn't do. And uh, of course, I think with Williams and his, and, and, and this, this took me back, has done more recently to the kind of critique that Terry Eagleton made, you know, a famous critique that Eagleton made of, of Williams in 1976 in Criticism and Ideology, you know, where he talked about Williams as kind of, uh, I think he talked about, um, uh, what was uh, Eagleton's phrase again, a kind of clenched withdrawal, uh, a clenched withdrawal in, in Williams's writing. Um, and this related to, uh, you know, in some ways it relates back to what we were talking about before that kind of, there was a kind of overcompensation I think in Williams's work which required it to be extremely kind of heavily guarded um, and, and this led to a, I think a lack of openness in his writing and um, something that that seemed paradoxically to be to be to be quite closed to the reader um, so I've developed that in various ways. And, you know, I found myself writing about his difficulties with the term abstraction, which I, I think you and I spoke about recently. <laughs> yeah, did yeah. Williams ever include a definition of abstraction? No, <laughs> is the answer to that, no. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's, my, that's my starting point, really, is the, okay. the, the very interesting omission of abstraction uh, from keywords, you know, given that it's a term that's absolutely central to his own critical practice. You know, he uses the term all the time. Um, uh, it has a kind of complex derivation, I think, in his work. Part of it came from Leverside criticism, literary criticism, and the idea that that literary criticism was was diametrically opposed to something that Levis called abstraction. Um, and um, then, of course, Marx as well, you know, Williams, like many thinkers of his time, inherited this, you know, a, a, a double edged sense of abstraction from Marx, you know, both that it is essentially the kind of condition of capitalist alienation and something that needs to be overcome, you know, it's in the, in the, in the essence, in the nature of the commodity form uh, to be abstract. Uh, the other thing, of course, Marx said that the only way to overcome abstraction is through the power of abstract thought itself, through the, the power of abstract critical thought. You know, that's right at the beginning of Capital, where he says, you know, this is what we need. Um, and we need um, readers who are prepared to think for themselves in order to, to realize this. But there's, there's an obvious tension there. There's an obvious contradiction. I, I'm very interested in the the, the book is is, uh, is is basically about the kinds of contradictory work that the word abstraction does and how it often essentially what it's doing is mediating ideas about what it is to be human or inhuman. Um, but it's also a book about modernism and, and that's why I've come back. I, I've looked at Williams on abstraction in a, a couple of other places earlier on in my work, but I've come back to it again um, because I just think it's so interesting and, and I have to say, you know, given that this is really all about, um, you know, kind of, it is about celebrating Williams's work at this moment, you know, the centenary that, you know, I, I do feel that this, 
this work that I'm doing on, although it is kind of pointing to an absence, you know, to a, a kind of blindness in Williams, it's, I just, I, I want it to be in the spirit of Williams's critical work. And I think it is, you know, and I, I even think that the Eagleton's um, original critique of Williams was also in the spirit, even though he subsequently went on to, to apologize for that and, and say that, you know, he felt that it, 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 the, the tone of the tone of what he said about Williams was ungenerous. And I, I certainly don't want to imply anything of that. But I do think that abstraction, that the concept of abstraction was a significant problem for Williams. And it and it um, dramatizes in a way the, the difficulties of that transition that he made, that he could, you know, um, that he could never quite kind of bring to light, you know, the fact that this key word, this is a key word, it seems to me, in and for Williams, the fact that it wasn't there in key words speaks volumes. And, and I think it has a lot to do with modernism, with, so although we know that he's a, he's a, he's a fantastic theorist of modernist cultures, you know, Tony Pinckney's edition, the, the politics of modernism was so important, you know, gathering together with, Williams's work on modernism, but but I also think that, that Williams, you know, he has a um, a real sense of it's the, the notion of distance and estrangement from modernism, which is because he feels that modernism is itself an estranged form, and I think this is where you know the, it's very interesting that there's very little um, he he didn't really deal with modernist texts very much at all. He tends to kind of wave at them from a distance, you know, he'll wave at Kafka and Joyce from a distance, but he didn't really engage with modernism. And I, I think he really, in a sense, um, uh, this applies to, to structuralism as well, which he included, which, which was part of the modernist um, kind of mindset or intellectual kind of toolkit for Williams. And there's an extraordinary statement that he makes in um, uh, the 1983 essay uh, Beyond Cambridge English, which was one of his um, retirement lectures, in effect. Do you know that, 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 that essay? Mm, that yeah. Mm, and, yeah, and, and it's, it's mentioned a lot. It's referred to a great deal. It, it, it had a, a lot of resonance for a lot of people, I think. Yes, it's one of those where he really does look back and he, he makes, well, there are a number of extraordinary things said there, one of which is at the beginning, you know, that, um, uh, that throughout his life, although his educational formation had um, I, means that he identifies with um, an educated literate community, his affiliations, he said, remained with the relatively uneducated and illiterate. And, and you know, he, the fact that he could still say that in 1983, I think in this final, you know, lecture, as it were, is very interesting. And then when it comes to modernism and particularly structuralism, he has a, um, a quite a revealing um, section where he talks about what he sees as the coldness of those structures. He, he says, I can feel their coldness and their strangeness. Um, John Mullen picked up on this in his uh, Hey on Why uh, lecture on Williams, I think the Raymond Williams lecture a few years ago, as evidence, Mullen said, you know, that, that well, basically, you know, Williams was a, um, a humanist. And what that seemed to mean for Mullen, I think, and, you know, through Williams was a kind of um, distrust of theory, you know, um, whereas actually Williams is one of the most, you know, um, accomplished kind of theoretical thinkers, I think, in the, in the recent British tradition, you know. But I think Williams made, that, that was a, a revealing um, statement um, because he did seem to associate modernism with that coldness and distance. And then that leads on then to the whole, the, the kind of critiques that people like Paul Gilroy and Edward Said were making, which I, I still think we have to take seriously about Williams's ideas of, of community, you know, and what was important, you know, it was the, it was the knowable community that was always important for Williams. And, you know, I, I often, I think I want to ask, what about the unknowable community? You know, what's, uh, um, the, there's a, a, a kind of, it's part of that guardedness, I think. 
in Williams's approach to things that, that modernism he couldn't never quite kind of square that sense of its um, need to um, uh, to to radically differ to break to disrupt forms of accepted common sense. I mean, I admire the novels enormously, um, you know, but I, I guess I am one of those people. There's a division, isn't there? Critically, there's a there's a division over Williams's fiction, and 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 while you know, I think it's they are politically enormously admirable. I, I you know, I think that in 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 terms of of kind of of the kind of imaginative range, you know, and and the ability to, you know, to to deal with emotion and feeling, um, then. Um, there's something not there's something not quite there, you know. So the novels are are obviously places where he want he felt that those those aspects of his work could be be worked out, could be rehearsed and, and realized. Um, but I'm not sure that they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it sort of it goes so far, and he and he touches on uh, mm. what what could develop more into. Uh, in, into into feeling emotion and so on, but it 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 it, it never really develops. But then I suppose, mm -hmm. on the other hand, you you can bring that to it yourself by by perhaps bringing your own experiences and feeling to it as 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 you're reading yeah. it, perhaps. Um, but, you, yeah. but the the um, I, I I guess the complexity of of the of the man makes him extremely interesting and 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 is is a, is a part of of the the, the legacy. And the fact that that we are still talking about him and still finding interest in his work, mm. uh, you know, I, I I do wonder what would have happened had he lived longer. What what how would he have been writing? How would his thoughts have shifted? Would he have have, have managed to introduce some of the, the the gaps that we've identified in our discussion today, maybe in, in into his work? Would he have morphed into something different? Mm. Um, so, certainly, his 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 prediction. Um, in, in towards 2000 uh, about that 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 rather sort of noisy um eclectic mm. postmodern kind of atmosphere um which which in, in which one might be writing it, it, it he wasn't far off but it's quite difficult for, for us to imagine that at the moment just because of the the place that we're currently in and have been for the last 12 months with yes. with yeah. um with, with a lot of those things having been silenced and you know m maybe the, it'll be interesting to see what creativity arises out of the times that we're in currently yes but yeah. it's certainly well, not some sorry yeah. gone. well i mean he and, and also in towards 2000 he, he talks there about in, in that concluding essay you know he, he talks about the the need to um uh you know overcome the treatment of of people and the world as raw material he repeats he uses that phrase a lot and, and that goes right back to culture and society this he said that the need to get over to overcome the inherent dominative mode as he called it then and you know that that you know in terms of green politics and and the environmental crisis now i mean that that is an incredibly consistent emphasis in williams isn't it through all the way through yeah. and and you mentioned social media as the means by which you know we can share williams's work but of course also that technology i mean that seems to me the that enormous the fascinating question is how Williams if he had you know lived longer if he'd lived to to uh, to see digital culture emerge and its capture you know by by corporate capitalism if he'd seen where we are now I mean that is a really really fascinating question I seem to recall in towards 2000 he has a he's more concerned you know that's 1983 isn't it and he's more concerned then with I think the um approach of cable television yeah um, <laughs> what that's going to be like and and of course you know typically Williams he was always the the main thing to guard against was cultural pessimism wasn't it you know he you know he said any techno any moment of technological change is a moment of choice um but but I have no doubt, I mean, looking at the kind of position that we're in now with the, you know, the, the full development of surveillance capitalism, you know, as Zuboff calls it now, um, you know, uh, I think he would be, well, I guess, you know, he'd be saying, look, this was a moment of choice and you've allowed them to get away with it. You know, you've allowed them to appropriate this you know extraordinary technology for for unimaginable forms of of capture really um, 
and the, me metaphorically perhaps the um the, the 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 fan dance and the military band are actually represented now by the noise of of, of social media and, and the internet and so on yeah. although of course he, he may have seen it as a way of democratizing knowledge as well of course and getting knowledge out there uh Absolutely. It would be that's where it would be fascinating. That's where you really want his analysis, don't you? Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed for for for, for sharing your your thoughts and your your experiences of um of, of how you've engaged with Williams over the over the over the years. How that the, the he has been a little bit of a starting point in your new book on ab abstraction.